be great. So welcome to Erica and Anna. And so firstly, I'd like to uh, ask, you know, bring Anna up to the to the spotlight. I think um, Jacqueline's going to do that for us. So welcome, Anna. So just a bit of background on Anna. She has um, she's from Defining Moments Canada. She has a master's degree um, of museum studies from the University of Toronto's Faculty of Information and an MA in history and a BA in history minoring in French. Uh, she's worked as a research assistant at the Canadian War Museum and at the Royal Canadian Military Institute, as well as the Multicultural History Society of Ontario, uh, the Veterans Centre at Sunnybrook and Service Women's Salute Canada. So a lot of varied background in terms of history. Um, she has a passion for preserving heritage and commemorating the unique stories that make up Canadian history. So welcome, Anna, to Novo Nordisk. And thank you for taking the time to speak to us today. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Great. And so, Anna, um, can you tell us who we're going to meet today? So today I'm going to be sharing with you the story of Dr. Gladys Boyd, uh, who was an early Canadian woman in medicine, um, and she was a pioneer in researching childhood di diabetes and diseases. And quite frankly, she was uh, Banting's eyes and ears in the endocrinology ward at the hospital for ch sick children, and then later at the pediatrics ward in Women's co College Hospital. So that's terrific. So um, maybe we could go back to the beginning. Can you tell us about a bit about her early life and what was like the world like um, when she was starting out? Absolutely. So um, Dr. Boyd was born in 1893. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of information about her childhood, but her, her the documentation of her life really starts when she graduated uh, from the University of Toronto's Faculty of Medicine in 1918. Uh, she had been the director of the Undergraduate Medical uh, Women's Council and part of the Women's Students Administrative Council. Uh, in 1920, she earned a fellowship in pediatrics at the Hospital for Sick Children, now we know as the Sick Kids. And a year later, she was appointed as the head of its endocrine services. It was while treating the child patients of her ward that Dr. Boyd uh, began her research into the field of childhood diabetes, uh, nephritis, which is the inflammation of the kidneys, uh, and tuberculosis. Uh, it was also during this time that she began following the miraculous goings on of Dr. Banting and his lab. So in October, um, I'll get into that story a little bit in a little, uh, little while, but uh, in October of 1922, uh, Dr. Boyd introduced herself to Banting and implored him to come to the hospital for sick kids or sick children to help her treat some of her own patients, which he did. Um, but again, we'll discuss more of that most shortly. Um, did, we want, doctor, did we want to, sorry, Anna, do we want to go on to the next slide? You can just yeah, let Jack sure. know when. Um, yeah, absolutely. When you want that that would be great. Yeah. great. Um, right. So um, Dr. Boyd had such an impact in her ward that she is credited with having begun endocrinology at the hospital for sick children and was the head of the endocrine services from 1921 to 1950. Now, prior to Banting and Boyd officially working together and all while continuing her work at HSC, uh, Dr. Boyd also joined the staff of Women's College Hospital um, as its chief of in 1922. Quote, as Women's College Hospital's only pediatrician, she attended to an average of 200 children annually in the hospital's outpatient department, diagnosing everything from common illnesses to complex childhood diseases, end quote. Um, it was Boyd's clinical research during this period that really gained her her notoriety as an early international authority in the area of diseases in children. So in 1924, Boyd was awarded her Doctorate of Medicine, for which she wrote a research thesis that earned her the Star Medal uh, from the Canadian Medical Association. Boyd went on to author the Manual for Diabetes in 1925, which became the standard consumer health manual for those with diabetes. Um, and as well, she earned her Bachelor of Science in Medicine at the same year. So in 1931, Dr. Boyd was issued the designation of the fellow, a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians in Canada in the Division of Medicine, as well as the fellow of the American College of Chess Physicians in 1932. Um, she received that fellowship after acting um, as the attending physician at the Preventorium which was an institution for patients affected with tuberculosis, but who did not yet um, have an active form of the disease yet. So over the next three decades, she continued uh, her medical research, 
and published numerous academic papers on the topic of childhood diabetes and nephritis. Um, in 1970, sadly, Dr. Boyd passed away in Toronto at the age of 77, but she had continued to provide medical assistance and support to family, friends, and colleagues all the way up until her final years. That's a very condensed version of her life story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think we can get the flavor that she was a pretty amazing woman. Um, maybe you could speak a bit about what sort of inspires me is, I mean, she's obviously so successful in becoming a physician and a scientist at a time when I have to assume that was really rare for, for women. Um, and so maybe you could just talk a bit about sort of the societal environment she was in and how she was someone that was able to, to overcome those obstacles. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the presence of women in medical wards and quite frankly, the presence of women in medical school um, during the 1920s, uh, is significant just because of how rare it was to have female physicians during that era. Um, Dr. Boyd is among uh, a small yet highly influential group of Canadian women who broke social barriers in pursuit of a career in medicine. Uh, for example, she was one of only four female graduates in a class of 101 students when she graduated from U of T. Um, Dr. Boyd would have also undoubtedly been paid substantially less for her work compared to her male counterparts. Um, and some of our other profiles that we look at on the Defining Moments Canada website, um, we do an early Canadian women in STEM project. Um, some of those other profiles look into that in more depth, just the, the disparity of pay. It's also interesting to note that she obtained many of her degrees, her doctorate and her BSc, for example, after she had begun her work at the Hospital for Sick Children and at Women's College Hospital. So evidence here would suggest um, that her ability and quite honestly, her willingness uh, to dive back into a male dominated medical education world uh, was due to the fact that she had already made a, a, a very prominent reputation for herself as a distinguished uh, pediatric physician. At this point, she had also become um, professionally linked with Dr. Banting, uh, whose name of course would have opened many doors in the medical field one only need to look to Henrietta Ball um, for another example of the impact that the Banting name can have in providing validity. Um, it is unfortunate, however, that Dr. Boyd and countless other women were only really taken seriously after having had uh, proved themselves <laughs> um, by completing groundbreaking research and or when their work was direct or when they worked with directly with notable men who were able to provide, who were able to vouch for them and their work. Yeah, it's um, maybe something that we've come a long way in that regard, but it's not 100% solved even now, I think, sometimes. Um, did you want to go on to the next slide, um, Anna? I think maybe we've got some more yeah, for sure. photos. Yeah, um, so maybe, yeah, we can dig a bit more into, you know, this concept of, you, you mentioned that she had worked with Dr. Banting and had reached out to him and was really instrumental in the treatment of children um, with this new idea of insulin. So maybe we could dig a bit more into that and, and what her role was in all of that. Sure, absolutely. So yeah, we can go on to the next slide. Um, so Dr. Boyd was obviously very influenced by the work of Dr. Banting and Dr. Best and McLeod and Collif as well. Uh, she learned of the successes of insulin that the, she learned of the successes that insulin was having in treating patients like Leonard Thompson and Teddy Ryder and Elizabeth Hughes. Um, so she wasted no time in trying to bring that exact extract to the hospital for sick children. So the strides that Dr. Banting and Best and the team had made in isolating the necessary extract to formulate the beginning frameworks of insulin um, were truly astonishing to Dr. Boyd. Um, and she was eager to apply this new treatment to her ward. Um, Dr. Boyd, in particular, realized that she had one early uh, one patient who was ideal for an early uh, recipient of insulin, and her name was Elsie Needham. So Boyd was only 28 years old um, and just four years out of medical school at the time that she first met Elsie. Uh, it was October of 1922, and the 11-year-old girl had been admitted to the hospital for sick children in a diabetic coma and was very much near death. After several days of her condition showing no signs of improvement, um, Dr. Boyd went down the street to U of T and reached out to Dr. Banting to request his aid and a vial of his new extract. Um, Dr. Banting obliged, 
And with the assistance of Dr. Boyd, Dr. Banting administered the insulin injection to Elsie and to the astonishment and marvel of all the surrounding medical staff, including Dr. Boyd herself, the young girl rose to consciousness within a very short amount of time of receiving the miracle drug. So the following year in 1923, um, the Hospital for Sick Children, uh, and partially Dr. Boyd as well, convinced Dr. Banting to become an affiliated researcher and use their facilities. Dr. Boyd um, worked alongside Banting and their collaboration resulted in, quote, an estimated 50% decrease in childhood mortality from diabetes over a 10 year period. So Dr. Boyd is mentioned several times in uh, Frederick Banting's Nobel Prize acceptance speech, although the reference are fairly clinical in, in subject matter. So on the subject of Dr. Banting, however, Dr. Boyd is quoted as saying, None of the praise that has been accorded to Dr. Banting for his wonderful work has been at all exaggerated. So Dr. Boyd, um, as one of the first physicians in Canada to treat uh, diabetic children with insulin, um, she did share her findings um, and she did say uh, of the 20 cases of diabetes treated in 1922 with insulin over eight months, she concluded that insulin, although not a cure, um, would help to arrest the course of the disease and and postpone um, the effects of it on young children. So it feels like it's maybe safe to say that without Dr. Boyd, um, the successes of insulin may not have happened as quickly as they did. Um, like I said, we, we hear all about Dr. Banting's amazing work and of course uh, a miracle drug that he um, disco uh, discovered and purified, um, but without that clinical application of Doctors like Dr. Boyd, a female doctor at a time when that was rare, this wouldn't have potentially taken off as quickly as it did. And she was definitely instrumental in, in her part in that for sure. Super and she is quoted as saying, you know, when you read up on Dr. Boyd, one of the big quotes that is attached to her name is that she was the one who attended to the daily work um, of the early development of insulin. So she was the one that was going to the patients every day and logging those, uh, their results and, and their reactions. Um, so, um, it was actually when, when Banting does mention Dr. Boyd in his acceptance speech, it's in reference to the daily logs that she would keep about the patient. So again, she was very much his eyes and ears in the children's ward. Uh, so she sounds like she was a very modest woman as well um, from everything you've said. And But that rigor of scientific method, definitely important in learning. I mean, they were learning as they were going, right? How to use this this miracle drug to help these patients. And she was clearly instrumental in documenting that. Definitely important. Mm -hmm. um, so once she, you know, with these early successes in treating children, maybe you could talk a bit about where her career in life took her after that. And, um, you know, some of the personal things about her that you learned in your, in your research of this amazing woman. Yeah, absolutely. So we can go to the next slide on this one. Um, so, uh, although, uh, Dr. Boyd's life story has been documented through the lens of her medical and professional uh, achievements, I kind of feel like it's her life beyond insulin and beyond treating childhood diabetes that makes her such an interesting person. Uh, first, Dr. Boyd was never married, uh, deciding instead to focus on her work. The absence of a spouse um, is also indicative of the times that she lived in that around the time that she would have been looking for a potential husband, uh, the First World War would have been declared um, and most of the eligible bachelors her age would have left to fight in Europe with many unfortunately not returning. Um, that said, however, uh, she would not deny herself the joys of having her a family of her own. Um, and she adopted a daughter actually named Nancy in 1932, which was very rare. So Dr. Boyd was a devoted mother. Um, when Nancy contracted polio as a young child, Dr. Boyd ensured that she received the best medical treatment possible. Um, Nancy also attended the best schools in the country, including uh, Havergal College for Girls and the Royal Conservatory of Music in Toronto, as well as Trinity College. Um, and Dr. Boyd prioritized her daughter's education and was very encouraging of Nancy's early and continuing passion for music, um, providing her with the best violins and piano teachers and that kind of thing. Um, Dr. Boyd uh, was also a very caring and a charitable woman. Um, she, during the Second World War, she actually housed a young girl from England named Mavis, um, who lived with her and Nancy for approximately six years. 
Uh, Nancy and Mavis became instant friends and remained like sisters until the end of their lives. Um, and Dr. Boyd may have also been involved with the Young Women's Christian Association, which was a worldwide organization that supported women in need of uh, in need by providing them with uh, shelter and food and better housing and education. Um, and Dr. Boyd also provided tutoring and support for young women, especially those in medical school. Um, further still, of course, uh, her tireless and unwavering dedication to the study of childhood diseases is undoubtedly what remains to be her most well-known contribution to society. Um, but these sacrifices made by Dr. Boyd for her daughter and for Mavis and for the people in her family um, is even more impactful considering that Dr. Boyd was never a wealthy woman. Um, she was never able to own a home of her own. Uh, this was partly due to her status as an unmarried mother. And she would often accept food or gifts in the place of payment when making house calls or attending to patients in the hospital. Um, out of compassion and admiration for Dr. Boyd, uh, a fellow doctor and his wife even let Dr. Boyd and Nancy use their cabin in Northern Ontario every summer. Um, and then another interesting storyline of Dr. Boyd's in the same theme of helping others is that Gladys Boyd helped to facilitate the adoption of her first cousin's son. So Dr. David Bailey uh, is a very helpful relative of Dr. Boyd's and an accomplished medical researcher himself. Um, and he shared his story with me about how he was born during the Second World War, um, but his biological parents were unable to care for him during the complexities of their war wartime service. Um, so David was transferred to the hospital for sick children 10 days after his birth. And this is when Gladys Boyd came into his life. Uh, she started his adoption into the Bailey family and she advocated for his welfare. Um, and this prompted David to tell me, quote, I am very grateful for Dr. Boyd, who enabled my adoption into a loving family and gave me the opportunities they otherwise would never have had. So in that photo that we have there um, of the young girl, that's actually Gladys Boyd at the age of 10. Um, Dr. Bailey shared that one with me um, and he considered it to be a remarkable window into uh, the personality of Dr. Boyd. He says that you can see how special she is even at that young age and you can see her confidence, wisdom, and compassion, just to mention a few obvious traits. Um, so yeah, Gladys Boyd was a truly, truly remarkable, remarkable woman um, in both her life in the medical wards and in her life beyond that. Yeah, and you've painted a really clear picture, Anna, um, of this remarkable woman that, again, I had never heard of until um, I started digging into this topic. Um, one thing that fascinated me when we were chatting before this uh, session was some of the maybe unusual ways you went about finding some of this information about Dr. Boyd, because as you mentioned, a lot of her clinical work has been documented in, in history. But the personal side of it, you had to do a bit of detective work, you called it. Maybe you could chat a bit about that. Yeah, um, this is another aspect of working on her story that I absolutely loved. Um, so uh, like you said, uh, her life is fairly well documented in, um, in considering her career achievements and her work at U of T and at, at Sick Kids and, and Women's College Hospital. And when I say fairly well documented, I mean in comparison to other women at the time. Um, Generally speaking, the history of Canada's first women in medicine is unsurprisingly not as rife with uh, biographical information as Canada's first men in medicine, for example. Um, but when developing the historical profiles of Boyd, um, I initially uh, relied on excerpts from archival material from Women's College Hospital and from Sick Kids, as well as some of the medical logs and her academic articles, which were a bit too complex <laughs> and didn't really share any light into her as a person. And then some brief mentions of her in secondary sources as well. Um, but unfortunately, these excerpts don't really offer a complete picture of her as a person. Um, so I did have to get a bit creative. Um, and a big source of information did come from uh, the U of T yearbooks, which have surprisingly all been digitized from that period. So her, her um, graduation photos in there and then her club photos are in there as well and some quotes from her. Um, and this also led to um, another, a bit more macabre um, avenue in which to find information. And uh, that was by finding her obituary. Um, Dr. Boyd had a very lovely and kind obituary written about her life on, in the Globe and Mail, um, which was where I discovered that she had a daughter named Nancy. 
Um, her daughter had unfortunately passed away only one month before I began my research. Um, but through that, I was able to find that Dr. Boyd also had several grandchildren. Um, so this is kind of where it becomes a bit more unofficial. <laughs> um, but the only way I was able to find these people and make contact with them was through Facebook. Um, so I sent them a Facebook message um, and they were thrilled. So they responded and then um, Wendy, who was very generous and, and very uh, forthcoming with information on her grandmother, went around to her family and collected all the family's recollections and even went to a neighbor who had met Gladys and was close friends with Gladys. So she did a little bit of uh, historical detective work for me as well. And then a few months later, after I had posted my article about Dr. Boyd, um, Dr. Bailey had reached out to me and helped fill out the remaining blanks um, and offered more stories about uh, Dr. Boyd, including about his adoption, um, and that the family very affectionately would refer to her as Aunt Gog. So long story short, uh, historical records do help you find out the facts about a person, the dates, their degrees and career accomplishments, but it, it, it is truly the firsthand accounts and the personal connections that bring these people's lives um, out. Um, and that's what we try to do at Defining Moments Canada is to uh, explore these definitional moments in Canadian history, but through the lens of the micro histories that make these monumental events happen. And you're doing an excellent job. Um, I, I, you've really painted a really clear picture, not only of this woman who was instrumental in, you know, the, the use and development and, and growth of insulin in those early days, but also someone that, you know, overcame societal odds to become that successful physician and researcher but also seems like someone who really was a modest caring compassionate woman at a time when you know it was difficult um at that time and it sounds like she's really um got a lot of people in her family now that that have you know her grandchildren and beyond that um are super excited probably to see their grandmother on on your website so thank you for sharing um, we've got a couple questions in the chat, so why don't we jump to those? Um, so the first one was, did she do any work on polio? You mentioned that her daughter had polio. Was she ever in doing any research or, or clinical application in that space? Uh, her focus was primarily on endocrinology. Um, and then through that beginning, she did start to delve out into just childhood diseases, generally speaking. So she was the head of pediatrics at Women's College Hospital. Um, she would have definitely worked um, and helped uh, children who did have polio. Um, I don't think that she really did a lot of um, research and, and, and focus on that exact disease, but I do know that she did come in contact with children with polio. And I imagine that when her daughter did contract it, um, she probably put a fair bit of effort into learning about it and then trying to find similar with, with diabetes, trying to see if anyone was tr in the midst of cracking the code of polio. Right. Yeah, good. Yeah, and then clearly her daughter survived that. So yeah. um, that's excellent. Probably in part through the care that she got from her mother. Mm -hmm. um, and then Gabrielle is asking, has, has her legacy been formally recognized by U of T or another institution? Um, again, given that none of us have heard of her, or at least I haven't, um, you know, is there is there that formal um, recognition for what she's done through this for, for insulin and, and for patients in Canada? Um, so U of T, uh, they include her um, a bit in their uh, uh, discovery and development of insulin fawn. So she is briefly mentioned there. Um, when we were speaking with the Insulin 100 working group, uh, they were thrilled to see her profile presented and a fair bit of them also did not know about her. So I think I probably rustled a few feathers on that one. Um, but I do know that Women's College Hospital does a, does a, fair, a fair good um, job at uh, really championing her story. They've got uh, their um, archivist, Heather, has written a great profile on her as well. Um, and they're very forthcoming, but they just don't have a lot of materials on her. Um, so a lot of this was, you know, yearbook clippings and newspaper clippings. And so um, there is a plaque of her somewhere as well at Women's College Hospital, although I don't know where it is. And <laughs> I have not seen it, but if somebody sees it, I'd love to see it as well. <laughs> okay, well, maybe if one of us is down there, we can uh, we can look for that for sure. Yeah. And, you know, obviously that lack of 
comparative lack of information is really, you know, a sign of the times in which she lived that her accomplishments accomplishments just wouldn't be written down as much as as her male colleagues for sure. So I think that's all the questions we have for now. If any other ones come up, we'll we'll pass them along to you, Anna. And for everyone on the line, um, we'll have we'll put up links um, on the website, our website um, to the, the piece that Anna has written as well as other um, resources for everyone if you have further questions about Dr. Boyd. So thank you so much, Anna. That was so interesting. Yeah, you're very welcome. Good. And